appreciate you uh, taking time out your schedule to be with me. I've been wanting to do this for some time now. Um, mm -hmm. The first time that I came in contact with you and your media was by way of the um, American Gangster series on BET. I seen you on uh, the Supreme Team piece. No, it was the Fat Cat piece. Fat Cat, pardon Yeah, I produced the Supreme Team and the um, Shower Posse, but I didn't want to go on camera for it. They wanted me on camera, but I didn't want to go. Those episodes on there? Yeah, produced? I co-produced the Supreme Team, and I full-out produced the Jamaican Shower Posse um, episode in the first season. You're killing it. How, um, how did you get in that position? Uh, with the book, Queens Reign Supreme. I love that book by Ethan Brown, right? By Ethan Brown, yeah, but see, the book was really my idea, you know. I pitched it to Ethan, and he did the, the book proposal, and we got a, a publishing deal through Knopf, Random House, and because um, he worked at New York Magazine at the time. Okay. And I, I got 25% of the gross across the board, film, international, and everything rights with the book. So that's why I went with him. But I, I gave him access to all of those people. I mean, it should be obvious to anyone. Like nobody's gonna give me something I didn't earn. Right. And, and, and in this world, if you don't have a track record and a strong brand, it's, it's very rare for you to actually get what you deserve. Most of the times, you're gonna have to get less than it. So if I got 25% of the gross, you can only imagine what I probably should have gotten okay. for the work that I did. Okay. So your, um, your value and you being an asset to the project, of course, was you were of that demographic? Well, I knew a lot of the people. As a matter of fact, the book in the, in the, um, in the, in the front is dedicated to the snake charmer. I mean, that's what they used to call me at one time. Not they, but a close, a close circle of people. And they called me the snake charmer because I was, um, I was very good at, at, at navigating very, very notorious people, infamous people. Now, well, I shouldn't even say infamous because they weren't household names, but within within their circle of demographic, people knew who they were, and they kind of moved the crowd. And some of them were known for, for a lot of like betrayal and things like that. Right. But they never betrayed me. Right. You know, so so they called me the snake charmer because I was a master of serpents. Not the ones that slither on their bellies, but the ones that walk upright. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So, why, uh, why was, what was it about the Fat Cat story that attracted the Snake Charmer? Well, the thing with the Fat Cat story is, it's my involvement with the Fat Cat story began earlier than that. In 2000, I wrote a play, um, a spec script called Fall from Grace, and it was loosely based on my life. Um, and the fall from grace, I, I had fallen off. I was at hit rock bottom, man. One day, I, um, I was sitting at on a park bench in the projects in Long Island City. I'm not from Long Island City, but I was out there, and I, I looked up at the sky, and I said, man, who the fuck am I? And the answer came to me instantaneously. And the answer was, you're a salesman, but you have no product. So I, I went about creating product. And the product I created was um, Fall From Grace. It was a, it was a mean script, man. Um, Jack Benson, who used to do VH1 Hip Hop Honors, I, I met him when I was in, in college. And we'll talk about that a little later. He read the script and he called me and he said, Nigga, did you write this? I said, yeah. But you know, he wasn't really in a position to get it, get it made. Um, and everybody who read it loved it. So um, some people connected to Fat Cat and read it. And they was like, yo, man, you, you need to write Lorenzo's story. Because that's, that's his name, Lorenzo Nichols. Right. Right? I said, you need to write Lorenzo's story. So um, I, I, met, I met up with his son, Raheem. And Ra is still my man to this day, right? And I, that was like 20 years ago. And Ra got me on the phone with his pops and we talked. And I wrote the script. And then, then I, I finished the script on um, October 15th, 2002. And two weeks after that, Jam Master J got killed. And the day after he got killed, my name circulated as the, they say, person of interest. But 
it was really like I was a prime suspect, right? So, and, 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 um, and the way, the reason why that ties into everything is because I waited almost like a year and I pitched my story to Playboy because I hadn't talked to anybody, not even the police. And um, I pitched it to Playboy because Brian, Brian Grazer from, I think it's Imagine Entertainment, he had the option rights on stories in Playboy. Mm -hmm. And I was using that, that tragedy in my life to kind of get leverage to sell my script. See, I don't, I don't, I'm methodical in everything I do. I do research. I don't do shit for clout. I don't care about the peanut gallery. I don't care about a whole bunch of nobodies. Who, when I say nobodies, I mean people who are irrelevant to my mission in life. So I'm like, yeah, hey, man, screw on this, that. They don't fucking matter. You understand what I'm saying? I'm strategic in everything I do. So yeah, I, I pitched it to Playboy that um, I, would, I would tell my story to them. And because of that, and I wanted to utilize that opportunity to get exposure to the script that I wrote. So somebody like a Brian Grazer could see it, could, could see that I'm a screenwriter, okay. you know what I mean? That's the only reason I did it. I don't, you know, the, the whole thing about Jay and uh, being accused and all that, that was a stressful period in my life. Um, that was really nothing, nothing that, that, that I'm proud of. You know what I mean? I'm not proud of the things that made me a believable suspect. But a blessing and a curse are one and the same, the difference being in the application. You dig what I'm saying? Right. So no matter what happens, right? After it happens, you can't undo it. You gotta find a way to use it to your advantage. And that's what I did. I took that experience and I sent it to Playboy through their submissions email. And Chris Napolitano he, re he responded, he was the features editor. So the submissions email, you're supposed to submit stories, but I always do everything. I like that. I always do that things by my own, my own style. I don't, you know, I'm unorthodox in everything that I do. And if you pay attention to me, you know, a lot of people don't understand because they, they conform. I don't conform. I'm not afraid of walking by myself. You dig what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, I'm here right now with you by myself. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm comfortable by myself, man. I, I don't need the applause. So anyway, uh, I, I hit Chris Napolitano with the email, and um, I said, look, I got something for you. I've been accused of X, Y, Z. I haven't talked to anybody, not even the police, but I'm willing to talk to you. And um, he responded. I, I didn't email him. The, the submission, you know, it's just, it goes to a general the process, yeah. Yeah. And he found it. it. It made its way to him. Whoever read it was like, hey, listen, we might have something here. Because I was also aware that at the time, in 2003, Playboy was looking to expand into the urban marketplace. A lot of people think that Playboy is smut. They don't even show the insides of the, 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 the vagina and all that. It's tastefully done. And it's really about the articles in Playboy. Right. So your top, your top CEOs around the world read Playboy. I wanted to be on their uh, radar. I, I mean, no disrespect, man, but, but if, it's, if they feel disrespected, whatever. I don't give a fuck about Pookie and Ray Ray talking about me on the project bench. And this is why those street publications didn't appeal to me. You dig what I'm saying? Right. Because the people who were reading them weren't going to do anything for me. I'm going to shoot my shot with the people who are in a position to make something happen. Right. And play what was it. Right. You dig what I'm saying? So they told my story, 13 pages. Because he uh, he came, he, he hit me back. And we went back and forth. And, and of course, I could write. I speak well, but I write even better. Right. You dig what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, he was gauging because what a lot of us don't understand, right? Because we're not readily, immediately accepted or given an opportunity. We like to say it's because of our race. Race plays a factor, but it's not as direct as everybody thinks. What people do is they're trying to assess you for value. And they assess you for value in your, in your communications, in your appearance, in your aesthetics. Absolutely. All of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So you cannot ignore those things and then when you don't get the um, desired result, say, it's because I'm black. 
Nah, Chris Napolitano, he was gauging me. He was like, oh shit. Like, this motherfucker working on something, right? Then he got me on the phone, because of course he got to make sure that the person sending the emails is, is supporting you. Because you know what I mean? Anybody can write an email, you know what I mean? You can hire somebody to write emails for you. So he put me on the phone. And of course, I, I oh man, you know, um, I, I just did my thing, man. You know, when the bell rang, I get off my stool and I come out swinging. You dig what I'm saying? So he said, look, school, he said, listen, I want to do the story but I think there's nobody better to pitch it to my bosses than you. So he set up the call, and I talked to Chicago, LA, and New York. I don't know who was on the phone. Right. And I told my story, and I told my story, and um, I'll never forget that, because I was in Atlanta at the time, and I was walking around in my boxes and wife beater, and I'm on the phone, pacing the floor. And um, he said, uh, I heard somebody say, when I was done, they said, wow, what a story. And then somebody else said, wow, what a life. You dig what I'm saying? So the next thing you know, I was in Playboy. And the uh, writer assigned to do that story was Frank Owen. See, you gotta remember that name, because his name is gonna come up later in this interview, okay. right? So Frank Owen, he, he was given the job by Chris Napolitano. I pitched the goddamn story, not Frank. Right? I took him through the hood, took him to Hollis uh, after, Jay, after Jay had um, died or got killed. And I hadn't been back there. And we, we, we don't have to rewind because there's some things that you need to, to know. And uh, I started getting people to interview with him for the story. And remember now, I'm accused of killing this man. And nobody's seen me since he died. And I pop up with a reporter in the barbershop. And I'm posted up there all day, and I'm making people talk to me. You understand? People got to read between the lines. See, I'm not going to say certain things about myself, but if you can read the tea leaves, you'll understand exactly who I am and how I move. Now, there's some people that will say certain things about me or whatever, but, man, let me tell you something, bro. I ain't take no L's out there. You dig what I'm saying? Like, yo, whether it be the media or whoever, I ain't never answer to nobody. And I ain't never been afraid to go at nobody. And I don't care who it is. And that's about as much as I'll say about me in the streets. You dig what I'm saying? Like, because I'm 57 years old, and that shit don't really move the needle no more. But when I was 20, 19, 21, 22. You see, those are the age, age that, that's the age group when you're supposed to be demonstrating the toughness, right? Yeah. Because you're Making tough. Your bones. Yeah. Yeah, but. I'm watching guys 40 doing it now. Like, damn, you had to wait, you had to wait to be an adult to be Still the cool man. ass kid Still that you man. never was. Yeah, me, I, you know, I've graduated from that, man. Right. You dig what I'm saying? But, but so, so anyway, man, we did that, and the, the article did well. I negotiated a thousand word sidebar with the article called "Framed and Defamed," and I did that strategically as well. I got paid as a journalist in Playboy, a top of the line publication. And I was setting up the groundwork for my litigation, framed and defamed in Playboy. You see, because when I go to a big time lawyer and I show him this is what's going on, so it entices not, them. Not, 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 go not, ahead. So, 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 uh, technically, the framed. Say the name. Say it again. Framed and defamed. Framed and defamed. That was you starting your process to a civil situation. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And what, what kept me from getting a civil situation is because they never solved the crime. Right. You know, I couldn't sue with, if it wasn't solved because, shit, technically, I could have been the person who did it. Right. You dig what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, when, when, before Playboy could run the story, they checked in with the Manhattan DA's office to find out, get intel on me. And, and Chris told me this. He said, yo, the DA told him, he said, yo, he didn't do this one, but he's not a nice guy. You know what I mean? But that's all Playboy needed to know, because they couldn't afford to give me a platform, and I was guilty. Right. They would have never ran the story. But when they did their due diligence, they got, they got the skinny. It was like, hey, he didn't do it. Yeah, he's, he's such and such and so and so, but not this time. Right. You dig what I'm saying? And then they went with the story. And then, of course, man, 
I, I, I got, you know, I don't like to think that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a smooth talker, but to me, I'm a big stage player, man. When, when it's on the line, you call yourself a snake charmer. You, you, know, you gotta have some, some elevated yeah, yeah, but, communication well, I, skills. I, I, I didn't call myself that. You know what I mean? They gave some, right. some close friends gave me that name and they just stuck, you know what I mean? But uh yeah, I, I just yo man, I'm a big stage player, bro. That's where I belong. You yeah, dig yeah. what I'm saying? And that and that's why, no offense to anybody in the streets or in the hood, that's why I'm not there. That's not the big stage, you know. That's what, that's what prepared me for the big stage, no dog. You dig what I'm saying? Niggas, it, niggas, got think me ready. niggas think that's the big stage. They do because they small they, life. Because they small time players, though. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? They and, and you can tell. I can tell. And I don't really be worried about them because they wallowing in the mud. But I'm soaring with the eagles. You know what I mean? Like, right. you know, man, they won't even know what in them. You dig what I'm saying, bro? Like, I'm just on a different level, and I, 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 I want. I want people, people watching this, who may feel like they don't like me. I didn't like you. you know I, didn't, I didn't even know you. Um, Yo, and there's a lot of people like that, I bro. Didn't, yeah. I didn't have an opinion on you when I seen you on the American Gangster series, mm -hmm. but we love Jam Master J and Run DMC. That, um, the situation with Biggie and Pac, you kind of say, them niggas is a part of the noise. You know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, like, yeah, them yeah, niggas yeah. true thug life, and they was a part of the noise. But Jam Master J, I remember practicing my B-boy stance in the mirror. Like, it, it was like, them niggas was like one of my uncles. I never met him, but I was damaged. I was personally just traumatized by that whole situation. And I wanted justice. I wanted justice. I wanted somebody to be held accountable for that. And um, your name came up. I, don't, I can't exactly pinpoint what they used to point out. I know what it was. There's, um, there's an alleged drug deal that happened yeah. in Los Angeles. Correct. And allegedly, Jam Master J ended up owing you $30,000. Yeah, that's the story. That's the story. All right. Um, there's a do documentary called Who Killed Jam Master J. Is that the Marshall Clark one or is that a another one? I, it's the one. There's a few of them. It's the one with the light skin brother who knows. Oh, yeah, David Seabrooks. David, how do you feel about the statement that he that he made in there? Um, I know Dave, right? I've known Dave all, the, all my life. Dave, is a, he's a special kind of guy. Dave is a dude that when he was a juvenile, got arrested and lied and said he was older than he was so he can go to Rikers Island because he wanted to see what Rikers Island was like. So he got to Rikers Island and they immediately took his shoes from him. An older dude from the hood saw Dave walking around with, with uh, shower slippers on because somebody ain't taking his sneakers, you know what I mean? I mean, and, 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 and it's no, it's no shots at him. He was a kid, he didn't even belong there, you dig know what I'm saying? Right. But that's how off he is. You understand what I'm saying? And and he he was like, Dave, the Dave I know is more like a, um, he's like a gigolo type dude, man. Like, he's not, he not the toughest type of cat. I mean, he ain't, he ain't hurting nothing. But he's one of them well manicured dudes, always got the tight line up, might have his nails buffed and all this. You know what I mean? Like, right. meticulous in his appearance and pre presentation. I wouldn't call him metrosexual, but he's into himself. And he found his niche, dealing with women, white women. You know what I mean? Like, yo, know, he ended up with Sammy the Bull Gravano's daughter, Karen Gravano. They have a, um, a daughter, Karina. She has a reality show, I forgot the name of it, where she's running around Staten Island and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. She doesn't mention Dave, not that I, I haven't watched it, but it's all, they always reference her as being Sammy's granddaughter and not Dave's daughter. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> they skip a generation. But anyway, I remember when Dave went to Arizona. Uh, and he told me, he said, look, man, uh, I'm about to meet the bull. Right? That's when Sammy first came home. And he wanted to just let me know in case anything happened to him. He said, Karen, she told her mom that I'm half black and half Puerto Rican because she didn't want to tell him that he was all black. Right. And my response to him was, I said, well, damn, Dave, that sounds like all nigga to me. You know what I mean? But 
I say all of that to say he ended up going to Arizona and joined up with Sammy the Bull. And then he caught a case with them and he went to prison. So you gotta think about who Dave is. First of all, he ain't he ain't the you know, he ain't wrapped too tight upstairs, right? He ain't the most he ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer, bro. I don't hate Dave for what he's doing. I think he's pressured. I think he got with the bull. Who knows how he came home? Who knows anything? And you gotta think, somebody who comes from where we come from, to just be loose with the mouth like that on camera, you know they didn't pay him no money for that shit like that, bro. So I think I think he got pressured. He might be in debt. By, by the directors of the, of no, the project? By, I was the by the streets. By the government, bro. The government? By the government building their case. Just to, to, to pressure to tell a, a story that included you? Yes, and I'll get around to that. You see, I, I think Dave, I think the government's whole thing is that they, um, they know who did it, right? But they want to establish that Jay was a drug dealer. That they wanted to do that first. Yes. Okay. That's because was that to emasculate a man's legacy? I don't. I don't know. See, I, I don't know. I just think that if if you tell me if I'm a prosecutor and I say suspects A and B killed victim C over a drug deal. And everybody else is saying that victim C don't sell drugs. You got to prove that he. Oh well, yes he did. Okay. You understand? So it's that like, that's yeah. that's what impeded the the, um, the investigation. People's uh, people not wanting to implicate Jay as a as a participant as a hustler. Exactly. That's what I think. Right? Okay. And that makes sense to me because nobody around Jay wants to say that he was selling drugs, right? I don't know if Jay was selling drugs. I said because if Jay was selling drugs, he wasn't selling drugs with me. Right. You dig what I'm saying? So that trip never even happened? No, it did not happen. So David made up a bogus story for a documentary. I, David went on a documentary to tell a story that I believe he had no choice to, but to tell. Because once those people got their hooks in you, man, yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you don't, if you don't grab your ankles once, man, you can't say I don't do that. So what would, what would be the government's motive behind pushing a drug dealer's narrative on Jam Master J's name? Well, if if that's what they think the story is, that, see, I don't want to get too too into hypotheticals, right? Right. But hypothetically speaking, if they have information that there's a drug deal that went on. Because Ronald Tiddar in Washington, he said there was a drug deal, right? Right. He said that Jay received 10 kilos from somebody in the Midwest named Uncle. Right. Right? So there was already a drug deal story. Tiddar was given a deal based on his information in the state. He had been, Tiddar has about maybe five felonies. He's a predicate, persistent. They could throw the key away on him about right. anything. But when he told him the story, and he followed my blueprint and did a story in Maxim instead of Playboy, right? <laughs> Yo, you know, like, man, you know, they say imitation is the best form of flattery, but sometimes imitating me is like a form of suicide. You know what I'm saying? And in Tiddard's case, that's what it was. So he did that story, and he threw Big D and Little D under the bus. He said they were the ones that killed him which was great news for me. But then people were still suspicious because the original suspects, they were trying to say it was me and Tenard, right? Right, right. right? so, and, and uh, anyway, Tenard said something about the 10 kilo deal. I don't know anything about it. I didn't deal with them guys. Me and Tenard never got along. The fact that they put me with Tenard is what saved me with the real dudes. You see, you got a lot of fake street dudes, right? And I hate the term, but everybody thinks they in the street just because they buy some fucking weed and smoke in a car and listen to rap music. I'm a street nigga, whatever. No, to me, if you're from the streets, it means you make your money in the streets. It means that's how you, that's how you survive. That's right. how you pay your bills. That's how you live. Yeah. You don't go to work at FedEx 
and, and, and throwing some Timberlands or some Jordans and automatically become a street dude. And I'm not saying that like a street dude is something to aspire to be like. But look, we're not gonna call a plumber an electrician, and we're not gonna call an electrician a carpenter. You dig what I'm saying? Like, yo, man. So a a anyway, this is what Tenard tells the people. Nobody ever identified uncle. I, I believe because whoever uncle is, if he really exists, it's because he's working. He may be an asset. You see, and that's why you have to establish Jay being a drug dealer with somebody else, because you don't want your asset to have to come to court and testify about the 10 kilo deal in this high profile murder, because you may jeopardize other cases you got going on even now. All right. You know, does it make sense to you? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get there with you. You're know, almost there. Keep, keep, almost keep there. asking me. I'll All right. Answer. So, um, boom. The, 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 the 10 kilo situation, your, your stance is you believe that they never wanted to identify him because they would blow. Man, if people are telling you that there's a guy named Uncle mm -hmm. from the Midwest right. that gave Jay 10 kilos. Why the fuck you worrying about me and some alleged shit that happened in 1995 and not focus on uncle? You understand what I'm saying? Right. Uncle's situation is directly connected. You're trying to tell people that something that supposedly happened seven years prior to the death was the cause of the death? That shit makes no sense. No sense. So it looks like they're trying to protect uncle, whoever he is. Right. That's my take on it. Okay. See, and, and what I understand about the streets and the drug game is that, yo, man, there's so many informants. I think Dave is working. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't do much to help this cause because he was rolling with Samuel Bull Bravado. Mm -hmm. You knew this man was a rat when you got down with his organization. So you good with that. And there's something else Dave said in the documentary that bothered me. He, he referred to Big D as like a, a brother to him. But you know he's a rat too. You are here claiming all these rats. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, so what, what, what are you, you leave me no choice. And, and I'm not somebody that like to run around to my, yo, he's a rat and it's that. You know, but come on, man. If it walk like a duck, a duck, talk like a duck, shit like a duck, that damn sure ain't no lizard, bro. You understand what I'm right. saying? Like, and, and I, yo, man, when, when Dave, when Dave did that, I looked at that shit and I said, I text Dave. I said, yo, man, are you serious? You on camera talking about this, that, and the third? Like, and just, I didn't say anything about anybody. And this whole reaction was like a, a cheese eater. You know what I mean? Like, motherfucker, oh, it's right there. Yeah. You, you, you dig what I'm saying? So anyway, I, I believe that, Look, whether you think that something happened with me and Jay in 1995 or 96, whenever it was, use your common sense. It didn't have nothing to do with October 30th, 2002. Whoever that dude uncle is, based on Tenard's testimony, right. and Tenard was given a deal. He was given seven years in the state. It took the feds waiting for his seven years to be almost up to come get him and put him in the feds. Yeah. yeah because the eyewitness, look man, I don't know if Tenard's telling the truth. I don't know these fucking people like that, man. I know them from the neighborhood. They was never part of my inner circle. None of them, not even Jay. And I like Jay to some degree, but I didn't like the people that was around them. The Randys, the Big D. Jay knew Big D was a rat. Jay got Big D a job at Rush Management. Big D was the VP of Rush Management under Leo Cohen. He was in there stealing from the artists. Uh, Big Daddy came, and came up in there with a dude named Infinite or whatever. Yo, they, they worked on this dude, they knocked him out. Somebody told me when they looked in the room, they were slapping his head with the phone trying to wake him up. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Jay knows this about Big D. If you know this about this Big D, why are you getting them jobs and rush management and all this? And it's because these things talk about snitching and all that. They don't have no problem with it. And that's their prerogative. You know what I mean? But people got to be honest. Like, I'm being honest right now. 
I'm not trying to disparage anybody. I'm just laying it out. And if you can fact check everything that I said, Big D been telling since the early 80s, working with the Queens DA. He lived on Jay's block. But that was Jay's big homie, though. And, 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 and if we're going to keep it real about the streets, people are very selective in who they, they hold accountable for That's certain right. things, man. Mm-hmm. This is just what it is. This is just what it is. So I don't want to hear about their false standards. There's a, a whole lot of inconsistencies in the streets. And, 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 and while I'm on it, that's why it was easy for me to just say, you know what, I'm done with this, bro. Look, man, when I was young, and I'm talking about a young man, I saw the streets as a, um, a rite of passage, right? I saw it like where you could prove your metal, you know? And when I say metal, I mean M E T T L E for right. people out there, not M E T A L, you know what I mean? And, um, you can demonstrate valor and all those things. I, I was a bit idealistic, man. I got in the mix and I started finding and realizing that you know, the shit wasn't, it wasn't what I thought it was. And once I came to that realization, it was easy to walk away from it, man. There's a, there's a, there's a famous movie everybody like to watch, The Godfather. And there's a scene in The Godfather with some lots of them we're talking about distributing drugs. And, and Don Corleone says, no, I don't want to do that because it's that other. And so also said, no, I don't worry about it. You know, it's going to be in the black neighborhoods. They're, they're animals anyway. Let them lose their souls. We love these fucking movies. Man. Yeah, bitch. Yo, man, yeah. look at what we glorify, right? And again, I don't knock nobody for anything because it's tough being a black man. You dig what I'm saying? It's right. tough for all of us, right? We at the bottom, bottom rung. It, we, it's hard for us to get respect from black women. You dig what I'm saying? It's super hard. So I get it, man. And, and, and desperation can, can make a whore out of most people, literally and figuratively. And, and I use that, 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 that cliche because, to me, selling drugs, bragging about selling drugs, is the equivalent of a woman bragging about selling pussy. Like, people do it, you do what you do, but you ain't supposed to be proud of that shit. Like, when did we become proud of shameful shit? <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? Like, everybody do their shit, man, but never in my life did I do, do wrong and think it was right. Right. And what I see going on right now is that wrong has become right for a lot of people. And they're not going to make it. And they're not going to make it. Because their moral compass is out of whack, man. They got no real standards or anything. You feel me? Yeah, so that, that, that's what's going on with, 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 with Big D is a rat, is a rat, excuse me. Uh, looks like Dave is one. And I believe this dude, uncle, for somebody who supposedly gave 10 keys to Jay, and this is central to his death, and you've never done anything to find out who this guy is? Right. Instead, you worried about some unrelated, made up shit from seven years earlier. Right. Come on, man. Recently, there was an article published upon, published online where um, the identity of Uncle was it wasn't established, but it was almost insinuated that it was BMF. That it was about the BMF. Yeah, I've I've heard I've heard those stories, right? And I'm, I'm wary of certain things because you know. Um, Sometimes investigators, prosecutors, are no different from um, people in the streets. And what I mean by that is, they cop chase, right? However, however, right, if that proves to be true, then whoever that individual is, they're going to have to come to court and testify. Why? If he wasn't To establish motive. Uh, Establish okay. motive. You see, and, and, and why if he wasn't there? I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna tell you something. Um, just last year, uh, the U.S. attorney reached out to my attorney, Marvin Kornberg, and they 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 put an offer for me to talk with them under the protection of immunity, right? 
Now, you know, I could have taken that offer and talked to them about all kinds of other shit that's unrelated. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, you think what I'm saying? That's a strong play right there. If they're offering me immunity, it tells you two things. They know I didn't do it. But if you know I didn't do it, and I didn't have anything to do with it, why do you want to talk to me? Why do you need me so bad to prove that Jay was involved in drug dealing? And it's because you don't want to call uncle to court. And that makes me think uncle is somebody high up. He's not a low-level player. Right. You dig what I'm saying? Right. So I'm sitting back, I'm watching. I want to see. I want to see who Uncle is. What did you think of the article? I read the article. The, the article, I read half of it. Um, Frank Owen, right? That's the guy that did the Playboy story. That's why I said his name would come up. He wrote that article. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you feel me? He wrote that article. And um, You think his encounter with you prior is sparked interest and, and, and um, pushed him to eventually publish this article? I haven't talked to Frank in, I don't know, maybe 15 years, something like that, more than that, you okay. know? Um, no, Frank is on his motherfucking head, man. He's a journalist. And from what I can see, he looked like, a, he looked like, he looked like one of them white dudes that really like to party. If you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying? Like, and, 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 um, when I met him, he was married. He's a British guy. He was married to a black chick. Then when I talked to him a couple years after, he was divorced. Me, I just think that you can always tell when a, sink is sh uh, a ship is sinking because the rats abandoned the sinking ship. Uh, you know, I'm not calling the women the rats, but women know what a man done. When they start filing for divorce and leaving, that's a good indicator that maybe his house ain't in order. Because they don't leave you when you're on top because they don't want to leave nothing for the next person. Right. You know, that's just how they wired. So anytime I hear a man's chick is leaving him or divorce, I'm saying, He down bad. Yeah, he down. Some, something ain't right. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's a telltale sign to me. You know, and I just gave that to everybody watching, so now they're going to be looking like, oh, yeah. But, but anyway, Frank is burnt out, man. And not only that, journalism is burnt out. Why you say that? And I, I read the whole article. That article made a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Based on um, the timeline. Yeah. He was um, given a lot of information by the government, I could tell. That's his source. All writers need a source. That shit was very fluid. And the time, if, you, if you're familiar with Run DMC's career, you know there was Dead Pop, 1995. Yeah. Those yeah. years like that. Probably with some really, really, really tough years. Gangsta rap had moved in. Run oh, DMC wasn't a factor. They, they were done right after Raising Hell because they went into, a, I think Frank talked about it, a, a contract renegotiation with Profile Records. Okay. And they they didn't want to produce another album. I'll share some. See, I grew up with Run and D. We went to Catholic school together and all that. Like, those were my boys. Jay, I knew from the neighborhood, but Run and D, we would be in each other's house. I knew their parents, they knew my parents. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, we go back, right? They only got 13 cents per album for their record deal, the profile. This is 1980s shit? Yeah, Black like men being 90, raped in the music business? Everybody was getting raped in the music right. business, you know what I mean? But uh, uh, we got raped, we get raped a lot because you know why? And this is just a little sidebar. A lot of times we be desperate. Uh, like I said, desperation make whores out of most people. You see? And then when you get your weight up, you don't want to be a whore no more. But you signed it. You right. signed up to be a whore, though. Right. You don't have to take those deals. But we want that fame and them bright lights so much. And, and who knows? Our back might be against the wall. Everybody know that we economically compromise. And they negotiate with us from that premise. Yeah. You dig what I'm saying? Like, yo, again, it's not because we're black, but black plays a role. Because we're economically boxed out. We're economically comp compromised as a result. And we're thirsty. In plain language, most of us are fucking thirsty. You dig what I'm saying? Like, right. so, 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 anyway, Frank, I believe the government has given him the information. Um, he mentioned 
that some incident about Jay being in Chicago with some dude, and I know who he's talking about. I'm not going to say that dude's name right now. I don't know the guy, but he's, he's, he's a strange cat. I never met him, but he's been so intrigued and intricately involved with this case from the beginning, and almost as if he's been trying to steer it in certain directions. Mm. You know what I mean? I believe he's an informant too, bro. Yeah. And they didn't say his name, but he's going to have to come to court and tell about that story and tell who Uncle is. And I believe Uncle, I, I got an idea who Uncle is. You know what I mean? Right. But I'm not going to say that either. Right. Because, you know, um, I don't want to be wrong. See, my thing is like this, right? I do my due diligence, man. I don't rush to judgment. Because there's things that you just can't undo. But you better believe if I'm right, oh man, I'm going to tighten the screws on everybody, bro. Because it means, it will reveal that there's a lot of people who, who knew. I believe the individual who is uncle, who I believe to be uncle, is very cool with a lot of people in the music business. Some people that I knew. And if I was to find out that, you know, these people had information, not that they could have told the police, but, I mean, I was fighting for my life. Do you know what it's like to be accused of something? And you don't even know how your name got involved in it? It's one thing when you know what you did, because then you know how to go back and cover your tracks. But when you don't even know how the fuck it happened. You don't even know how to protect yourself. Right. And that's the situation I was in. And I'm in a much different situation now. I done did my push-ups and got my weight all the way up. And I ain't no two-bit drug dealer or two-bit shoot-up-the-club thug or none of that. I'm way above their head, bro. Now I punish their ass in ways they won't even imagine. When um. When someone was finally arrested, was that a relief to you? It took them 18 years. I was relieved. So you, that 18 years of people blaming you. Yeah. So you like, motherfucker, like you aggravated by, by the whole situation. I'm not, I'm not aggravated. Um, I'm waiting for these dudes to get convicted. Yeah. I've talked to lawyers, right? Every time my name is mentioned with this case, gives me a four-year window to file a lawsuit. And everybody who mentions my name is on the list to get sued. You understand? So every time they do these bullshit documentaries, see, here's the thing, right? I'm a black man, obviously. What that means is these people think I have no recourse that they can just trample on me and get away with it. Because most of the times, we just want to, I didn't do it, I told you I didn't do it, and be happy with that. Man, man I'm so glad they know it ain't me. That ain't enough for Curtis. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. Yo, you understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, that's, yeah. Master Jay, that's a big deal. Man. Come on, like, man. That ain't I, enough for me. Yeah, that's People want to, to pay for that, you know what I mean? I've I seen, I seen dudes like Hurricane. I don't, I don't even really know Hurricane. He's on, on the documentary he's talking about. Yeah, school is tough, but he ain't tough to me. And I'm like, yo, what is he talking about? Like, yo, I don't even, yo, I don't even know this dude, man. I mean, I seen him in the neighborhood. I don't know him. Right. All I know from Hurricane is that uh, he was in a rap group called the Afros, where he put on an Afro and talk like Pootie Chang, and I, you know, he's an entertainer. I remember dancing to Jerry Lewis on the corner one late night or something, tall, skinny, and jumping around. And, Yo, I don't know these people like that, man. You dig what I'm saying? Um, other than that, the only thing I know about Hurricane is that he got shot in Andrew Jackson High School. He was the first person to get shot in a, in a New York City school. And to be the tough guy that he, he claims to be, wearing sunglasses and interviews and all, like the Terminator and shit, the only thing that happened to the person who shot him is they, got, they went to prison. And somebody testifying. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man. You know, like, and, 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 and Hurricane, if you see this, man, 
You need that, man. You need to keep my name out your mouth. You need to stop pretending that you more than just a fucking luggage carrier for the Beastie Boys and they don't even need you no more, man. Why do you, I don't know why these people want everybody to think that they, they street, what is it about the fucking streets that you just can't be a solid man anymore? You gotta be street. I think it's a, de a decline of our value system. Absolutely, bro. Yeah. Yo, man, there's a lot of dudes in the street who ain't shit. There's dudes in the street who who sell their body for money. I know dudes, man, that, um, for instance, going for a little tangent, in Hollis, there was a, a, a gay dude named Roland that used to work in um, Larry Lucas Cleaners. Frank Lucas' brother, yeah, his cleaners was on Hollis Avenue. You know what I mean? Not, not in the Bronx. Not in the right on Hollis. Larry Lucas, I know Larry. You know what I mean? Not, not no, he was a grown man. I was a kid. We used to put our clothes in the cleaners. But Roland the Gator was the tailor in there. There was dudes in the neighborhood who would get with Roland, whatever they do, let, let, let them top them off. At least that's what they would say. Who knows what they was doing with the pump? You know what I mean? Like yo. He rent them cars and all of this shit, bro. This goes on in the hood and been going on. Those are street dudes too. But they don't have my set of morals and code. See, they, this street, street nigga shit is a, such a generic term. There's all kinds of scumbags in the street, yo. Just be a real man, be an honorable man. Say what you mean, mean what you say. And whatever your code is, stick to that. Right. You dig what I'm saying? And, but, but anyway, back, back to Hurricane. I don't know why he was talking about me. He never, nobody in Jay's family or Jay's circle has ever reached out to me to say, yo, man, I, I don't know if this will mean anything to you, but yo, man, I, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Bro. Not one. Not fucking one. Right. So I'm not thinking about them. The only person, to be honest with you, and because I'm a traditional dude. The only people that I wanted justice for Jay for was his mom and his kids. Everybody else, man, fuck him. They said you had an encounter with his sister at the funeral. Was his that, sister was said that. that was that but, real? Um, I did have an encounter with her, but not at the funeral. I didn't go to the funeral. Could you imagine so me going to the funeral? At? It was when we was doing a Playboy article. She, um, she, she was walking down the hall. It was the first that was back. They must have told her, the word got around that I was in the hood. Right. Think about it. I'm posted up. If anybody was trying to get with me, I gave them all day to get with me. They were stunned when they saw me. So she must have walked down here. And she saw me, she said, she said, hey, school. I said, what's up, Nita? I said, can I get a hug? She said, no, I can't do that. I said, that's all right. I said, you probably hung the killer every day. It wasn't at the funeral. She just mixed up the location. Okay. But it, it did happen, just not at the funeral. It happened on the corner of 200 so and what, hours. What was her response when you said you probably she said, the killer? She said, I probably do. She, she said, I probably do. I, I just knew from the beginning that there was somebody close to him. Anybody with common sense, man. You know what the, a big problem is with the hood? Is we don't have a lot of critical thinkers in the hood, bro. And motherfuckers love drama. Mm -hmm. And you know, my name had been connected with so much shit, man. I think there's a lot of people who were just like, yeah, fuck that, he's going down. Yo, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yo, yo, man, there was a lot of people who just, I would have never, 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 her Jay. You know, not to sound cocky, but, and not to disrespect anybody, but to me, Jay was a DJ, man. Like, I, I don't, I don't make my reputation on hurting entertainers, bro. That's not what I do. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yo, remember what I told you earlier in this conversation? I look at the streets as a rite of passage a place to demonstrate valor and honor, honor and integrity. You don't demonstrate valor going after, you know, easy marks, man. Okay. You go after the tough ones. 
and, 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 and again, no disrespect to anybody, but I would have never gotten the satisfaction of going after Jake or anybody like him. Tenard, yeah, you know, yeah, Tenard. Somebody like Tenard, Tenard got a reputation. Tenard does, you know, did a lot of things. I don't know if he did this. Right. I don't like these people, but even when I don't like people, I'll never implicate them in anything that I don't know, man. The article implied that he has something to do with the murder of Randy Stretch Walker. Was that something that was spoken of in Queens prior to the Jam Master J investigation? Because uh, during, the, during the course of his robbery spree, somewhere in that investigation, it was revealed that he was a subject. Yeah, because Jay's people was busy telling him. Jay had so many rats around him. They was, uh, I mean, people asked me about Tenard and Stretch, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I just don't know. I know a, 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 another dude had got picked up for it, but um, because allegedly uh, the car that was used, um, he owned a car like that, but they couldn't charge him with that because he he was um, he got he only had use of one arm, so there was no way he could drive and shoot. Because he had got shot with an AK-47, mm -hmm. and he had, he had lost the um, use of, of one of his arms. I think he got it back now, but you know, at the time, and I think they was trying to connect Stretch death to him getting shot. Yeah. You know, Stretch, um, a, new, uh, a new Stretch, my, one of my good friends was close with Stretch. I tried to do um, a... Um, a dedication album for Stretch, Daughter, and um, not because I was a friend of Stretch, but my man was, you know what I mean? And it also was a way for us to get in the game, so I had uh, Ed Woods, the entertainment a a lawyer, who was no longer with us, he drew up the papers and we had a lot of people sign on to, to, to do the dedication album and I had a meeting with, um, with Leo Cohen about it. But Leo, he didn't, he didn't want to do it. I think um, Tretch, um, Shop G, even Diddy had signed on letters of intent. Right. And we was trying to put the album together. Um, surprisingly, the, the people who didn't want to do it were the other members of his... Uh, his wow, squad. Yeah, yeah. They said they was working on their own thing. You know, look, and, and again, man. And that never, and that never came But ain't that how it always happens? You, 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 on, you in the front, you got something going on, you got traction, and the people who ain't got no traction, they always talking about, now nah, we get ready, we gonna do our own thing, and they never do it. They never do it. And it didn't just happen to me, and it didn't just happen one time. And so when I see people and they don't have shit, I don't wanna hear about the white man and white supremacy. You niggas don't know how to get out your own way, bro. You understand what I'm saying? Like, they don't want to get out their own way, man. So, you know, I, I had traction. They were supposed to get with me and say, listen, man, I appreciate what you're doing, but that's our homie. We should be the lead on this. You can be involved. That's business. That's business, man. You think what I'm saying? But when you got an ego and you're insecure, and you in a competition with people who ain't even competing with you. You just get in your own motherfucking way, man. I don't even deal with these type of motherfuckers no more, man. I'm on a whole different level, bro. You dig right. what I'm saying? I've outgrown them. You dig what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I've outgrown them.